Hey folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. We are at episode 26, I believe. That's a really cool thing. Um, we are chugging along as always. We finally have hit a little bit of a uh, respite from the convention season. We have a good month, a solid four weeks of uh, nothing before we have to go to Gen Con. So we are taking a breather, as it were, uh, but we're still going to be continuing to put out all of this uh, content for you guys because that's what we enjoy doing. That's what we do. So um, I've got a great episode of great contributions uh, this week for Throat Punch Lunch. My contributors are hitting it out of the park, as it were. So that's all well and good. But before we get to those contributors, I want to introduce a contest. Now, the contest is going to be for uh, this copy of Zombicide Black Plague that uh, everybody that went to Simon Expo got a copy of Zombicide Black Plague in their swag bag. So, I've already got a copy. I've already got a whole bunch of Zombicide stuff uh, for Black Plague. I enjoy the game immensely, so I don't need this. So I want to give it away. It has been played by myself, uh, Z, Derek, um, uh, Berkey from the Berkey and Badger show, Kevin Burkhardt's Meyer, and uh, Robert Newman from Epic Gaming Night played it uh, with us at uh, the convention. So it has been opened, it has been punched, but everything's there and uh, you can go ahead and play it as is. So this contest, I want you to send me an email at dicetowersam at gmail.com. It'll be right here for you. Uh, so you can just go ahead and check it out there. But I want you to send me an email about how you got into the hobby of board gaming. And yes, I'm calling uh, it a conglomeration, the board gaming hobby, which can include anything from 18xx games to tabletop miniature games to historically based miniature games to um, Euro games, to gateway games, to whatever you'd like. I'm calling just, just the huge uh, board gaming hobby that we have as a whole. I want you to send me your story about how you got into uh, board gaming. So just one entry per person, please. I don't care how many email addresses you actually have under your belt. Just one email from each of you. I would appreciate that. We'll send those. We'll get them conglomerated up. And I guess that's my word of the day. And then we'll have a random drawing for this bad boy right here. Now, with all that being said and over and done with, let's get to your contributors. This is Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a mere thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. Since most of my stuff is currently packed up in boxes, I've been focusing on small box games that are going to be easy for me to take in the car when I move. And that means that this week we'll be covering the tile laying game, Shahrazad. Gameplay for Shahrazad is actually very simple. All you do is you draw two tiles off the top of the deck. So in this case, I have a number 11 and a number 7. And then you lay them out in sort of a tapestry formation. So you only have to play one at a time. So let's say I put down an 11. Then I'll draw another tile and see what I get. All right, I have a three. So one of the goals of this game is to make sure that as you lay the tiles and you lay them offset to each other like this, you do not put numbers that are too high towards the left. It should go up from left to right. So seven to 11 is good. But I would not take this nine and then put it over here by the 11, because that would cause me to have to flip this over and count it as a non-scored tile. And if there's no other path from left to right for these tiles, they'll also get flipped and counted against my total score. The one other move you can make other than just laying a tile and drawing a tile is replacing a tile. So let's have a look at this little setup. I have a 16 going to a 13, and I know that that's wrong because numbers are supposed to increase from left to right. What that means is that I could, for example, take this lovely nine and replace the 16 with it. If I do that, I have to draw one more tile and then I have to play two tiles on my next turn. So you can't replace tiles on consecutive terms. You, turns you have to replace once, play two tiles, and then keep going from there. So let's put this one here and this one here. 
After all this tiling, you might end up with something that looks like this. After all, the game is called Shahrazad, and that means that you are in the role of Shahrazad, who has to tell the story of the Thousand and One Nights to a king who will kill her in the morning if she doesn't hold his interest. So if you're going to tell a story to someone like that, it better be a darn good story. That means it has to be consistent from beginning to end and that you have to have as many parts that go together as possible. And that concept is what informs the scoring of this game. So in addition to having numerical rules where numbers have to ascend from left to right, um, you also have to make sure that all the threads of your story connect from beginning, the leftmost column, to end the rightmost column. So that means that these little guys who don't really logically connect super well will automatically be out of the story. So these guys don't really have a clear path from beginning to end. Another issue, of course, is that we have a nine that leads to an eight over here. So this nine is gonna get flipped. And unfortunately for us, that causes even more continuity problems because not only does this nine flip, but it cuts off other parts of the story. So this tile no longer has a valid path to the end of the game. It gets blocked off because this tile is blocked off and then this tile is blocked off. So basically you can end up blocking yourself off all the way through one of these games and then miss out on a whole bunch of points because you missed one number. So after you eliminate any tiles that won't be scored, what you do is you count the suits that are touching each other and you get positive points based on that. So this round we didn't do so hot. You'll get two points for two reds touching. You get two points for two blues touching and there are no yellows touching anything and there aren't any black cards left. So that would mean that you basically got four points and then minus all of these tiles. Fortunately, when you really play, you're gonna do a lot better than this. This is for example. Um, then you actually play a second round where you mix up the tiles that you played. You can actually keep one column. So let's say I wanna keep this kind of middle column. Shuffle what you have and then play one more round. And it's your combined score from both rounds that tells you how you did. Shahrazad's theme may be an epic story, but it's not really an epic game. I would recommend it if you're looking for a game that comes in a small box, doesn't take much time to play, and it's actually very relaxing. I find the tiling and the art sort of meditative and I recommend it for that sort of need to spend 15 to 20 minutes chilling out and I wanna do it with a game. That is what Shah Razad is for. So if that's for you, I recommend you check it out. Happy gaming. It's Roy Kennedy from Epic Gamer Night, and this is Roll With The Punches, where we take a look at randomness in games and how randomness can make a game exciting, and also how to twist that luck into your favor. Last episode, I talked about a classic push your luck game, and today I'm gonna to talk about a game with a push your luck mechanic that's just come out, and that is Tiny Epic Quest. In Tiny Epic Quest, during the day phase, you're gonna be using these actions and then following your opponents as you move your different units around the board. But we're gonna talk about the press your luck mechanic in here, and that happens during the night phase, which is the second part of that. Um, that's when all the different areas that you've put your guys out on the board, you're trying to complete those to be able to get extra points and up your stats and collect cool new items from the item rack. So one of the things you can do is you can go through these different temples. So the temples you have to roll specific symbols, then there are also goblins you can defeat. When you defeat goblins, you're gonna have to roll specific symbols. And then for magic spells, you have to make sure that the magic level is up to a certain level before you decide to rest. So anytime you roll goblins, you are going to be taking damage on your character unless you spend power to help defend. You can always spend two power to negate a goblin, but any other goblins you roll are gonna pass around to the other players. So just because you are about to rest on your next turn doesn't mean that goblins won't come and attack you as well. So you'll roll your dice and you're trying to complete several different things. So you really need the different torches and scrolls to be able to go up in the temples. The first thing you do is you do your goblins. So I would take one damage and the next player around the circle would take a damage and you'd have to defend that. And if you ever get dropped down all the way to zero health, 
any of the stuff you're currently doing becomes undone and you go back to your castle. So it's definitely super brutal if you mess up. But you can race down to throughout the temple and any other players that are currently can use those icons can use them as well. So I'm the red player and I'm going further into the temple, but the yellow player can also go there too. And we're both racing to do this quest, try to equip the lantern to one of our characters and have extra quests for the end of the game. If you roll power dice, you get those, but the whole pressure level mechanic is you're trying to make sure to complete all the things before you run out of health. And also the first person to rest, if you get to the last base of a temple, they'll be able to claim any quests there first. So it's kind of like you're trying to race to the end, trying to not knock out your char characters, and also um, be able to do the different things. Another thing is the magic. So there's a magic track over here. Each time any player rolls magic, the magic track goes up higher. And to complete certain spells, like to complete the level one spell book, the magic has to be at least in the level one here, and you have to have your character on the obelisk that matches that. And then if this goes up to level two, it changes so each goblin now does two damage and you can no longer gain power. Power is how you mitigate rolls, kind of mess up the goblin things, give yourself extra torches and maps so that way you can go through temples easier. So lots of different ways to mitigate by utilizing your power and trying to regain power and then also trying to make sure you get all your quest stuff done without having a bunch of goblins knock you out and sending all your guys back to your castle. I definitely enjoy the pressure luck and randomness in Tiny Epic Quest as you're trying to go deeper in the night phase, as you're trying to get the symbols to go through the temples and up the, the magic level so that way you can complete different spell books and then also trying to take out the different goblins around the map that you're trying to attack. It's always, you're trying to push and push and push so you can complete all the things you're working for during that round of the game, but you don't wanna to push too far because if your health drops all the way out, you're gonna lose all of your progress. It's also very interesting. I've had games where I completed everything and I was just right and I had stayed in just a little bit too long but I thought I was good and another player rolled a bunch of extra goblins and they came around and ended up knocking my character out and undoing a lot of my progress. So it's like how much do I push? I can get ahead in the game with points or I can play it safe and do resting and try to not do as much in one turn. So Tiny Epic Quest, lots of pressure luck randomness but also interesting ways to mitigate it with your power. Hi everyone, welcome to a special episode. We're gonna call it Confessions. So we asked some publishers and game designers at Dice Tower Con 2017, what game did they enjoy and play as a child or when they were younger that they'd potentially like to see come back? My pick was a little more eh, girly than some of the others, but I'd love to see Mall Madness make a comeback. Let's check out what everybody else had to say. I didn't play many games when I was a kid, but when I was a teenager, I played a game called Nodwick. It was like a magician, and you were like trying to put it together. It's crazy. It needs a new deluxification and bring back. A game I played as a kid that I would love to see come back and redone? Nightmare. The VHS tapes, obviously not VHS tapes, but definitely Nightmare. I'd like to see the Game of Life brought back, even though it's still in publication, but as a legacy game that you play from start to finish. Tactics 2. It's an Avalon Hill war game. Tiny little chits, a whole bunch of them, crazy big board. I have no idea if I played it right because I was like nine when I played it, but it was awesome at the time. So this game I played a ton when I was little. We would play at my family cabin every single year and it's called Fill or Bust. It's a push your luck dice game. It's super cute. I haven't seen it in years. Maybe it's still in production. I don't know, but it was fabulous. I was just asked if I could reprint any old game that I played when I was younger now. Uh, I went old school miniatures games and I loved Cronopia when I was young and of course all those miniatures, all those things are gone or unless I want to pay thousands of dollars on eBay. But if somebody somewhere out there redid that, I'd buy it all. So if you want my money, Make it. The game I would like to see come back from as a child is Clue. I can't believe it's out of print. It was like my favorite. Wait, it's, they still have Clue? Nope. Well, I love this confession so much I made a whole company for it. And the game that I would really like to see come back is Dark Tower. If only there was somebody who could bring it back. 
I have some of the most fond memories of playing King Oil back in the day. In fact, I mentioned that, like, that I loved that game so much on some podcasts once, and somebody came to me at a convention and handed me a copy of King Oil. It's a really great game of putting oil wells into like this kind of three-dimensional oil field, and if it goes all the way down to the bottom, you don't strike oil, but if it stays up the, the thing, it, you've sprung oil. Really cool game, very physical look to it. Looks beautiful uh, after you've played it, and, and it's kind of cool and cutthroat because you can steal oil from other people's like oil fields too. Very cool, King Oil. Absolutely, I would love to see the game Dark Shadows, which was one of the worst games probably ever made brought back because I loved playing it as a kid. I, am, I immediately thought Mousetrap, because I've been thinking of that game a lot recently for some reason, and I would love to play that again. I love that game. I want to play a game from like the same time period that we would have been playing together, but I want to see Hi-Ho Cherio. <gasps> but I was thinking you were going to say that. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. But so we can like upgrade it and like make it harder, but I really like that game. We yeah. can make it like we're chopping down the trees, we're chopping down people, but we're, we're like, getting I, a little. You have to do all of the work yeah. in the orchard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You run the orchard. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> My game would be Crossfire. It had the epic TV commercial, it had uh, that awesome little dexterity component and that franticness of just trying to just get that, that little roller guy over the edge as fast as possible. The one problem that thing had was it would always jam and not work so well. So hopefully they could fix that in a reprint. Uh, but yeah, and bring back the TV ads. Crossfire, you get caught up in the crossfire. Yep, that's it. <laughs> it's tough. Um... I would say Doctor because I don't get a lot of action, but more importantly now, I would probably say Mousetrap because I've got a big rodent problem at my place, like there's a lot of rats, so I would say probably Mousetrap. The game I would love to come back is actually a Milton Bradley game. Yeah, figure that one out. It's called Skirmish. It's from the American Heritage uh, series. It was a great, great war game. It was the first game I ever played, so I have some romantic feelings towards it. Not really weird, but <laughs> good romantic feelings to it. I always reminisce about it. I actually still have my copy, but I would love to see it updated with new miniatures and have it out there so everybody can experience everything that I did when I was younger. So there you have it. That's part one of Confessions at Dice Tower Con. Stay tuned in a couple of weeks where we'll take a look at part two and see what everyone else has to say. In the meantime, go down in the comment section below and let us know about a game that you played when you were younger and hmm, would be really happy if they brought it back. See you next time. Oh,
Welcome back to Throw Punch Lunch with Brian and Carla Drake. We are still at camp, as you can tell. What's up? <laughs> By the floral pattern and stuff. They're like, what? Nothing. <laughs> uh, we're back at camp, and we are talking about some stuff today. Stuff we like. Games that re-implement characters in a unique way, or players in a unique way. So, no. that reintegrate players into a unique way. If they get eliminated from the game, they get to get back in in a good way. Uh, Elder Tauras get about this. If your character dies in Elder Tauras, you have like a eulogy that says, oh, they died, they didn't make it out, but uh, here's their stuff. Or they go to the insane asylum and here's what happened to them. Player elimination like that's great. Mansions. Mansions is good. If one person dies twice, actually, uh, the whole game shuts down in one more turn. If somebody goes insane, well, they become a bad guy. Um, if kind of. Kind of, potentially. You might not become a bad guy. You, you can got, still be a winner. You can be a winner. I'll just like yourself. in life. Uh, also, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Dead of Winter. If you get voted out, you become your own, like, exiled slumlord leader thing, right? So, that stuff we like is games that re-implement eliminated players into a unique way. However, stuff we hate is... Player elimination. Player elimination. Player elimination. It's a horrible thing to us. So, again, you might like this, but we I don't like... It. I, we don't like player elimination for the simple fact of once you're out, you're out. And because you can't play anymore. Because you've been eliminated. eliminated. <laughs> That's right. Duh. So we went to a board game cafe in our uh, area. And, you know, if you go to a board game cafe, you know the library is not going to be as big as maybe yours if you have a bigger library. Between us and our friends, we have a, great, a good size library, right? Um, not like the public library, that's not what I mean, but like game library. We're not talking about books. We went there and they had a whole lot of games of. One game. Red Dragon Inn. Never played Red Dragon Inn. No. So we played Red Dragon Inn. He had a bunch of expansions. We just played it. I'll tell you what, though. He was really good at explaining games. Anyway, we sat down. We played it. Four of us playing. Uh, I went out. Andy went out. Immediately. Immediately. Because they were terrible. Fifteen minutes later, it's still Carla and Jordan playing against each other one-on-one. -on -one. And then I think I won. And then I think she won. The point is this. Andy and I were just wandering around the store as they are finishing this game. Player elimination is a weird mechanic. I don't like it. In fact, that's why it's under the stuff we hate part. We hate, it. hate it. Another good example, actually the prime example, what prompted this whole episode was the Oregon Trail. Not the Oregon Trail like this. Not that kind. That kind's good. Like the computer kind. We used, did y'all do that in library? We used to go to library class and play. Mm -hmm. No, I went to public school. My bad. <laughs> so I just I just went for elementary school. But anyway, here's the deal. And middle. And middle. And I was a nerd. <laughs> Surprise. Here's the thing, though. Oregon Trail, the board game, the card game. Not so much. Because what happened was we played. You can die on your first turn and never play again. So what happened when Carla went out first turn. Jordan went out. Andy and I played to the very end. Let me tell you how fun that was watching them play by themselves while we sat there. Pretty bad. We died. We died. 
But you know what we played after that that very day? Do you know? Mansions of Madness Second Edition. So it brings it full circle to games that are good about this. So we died. We just sat there, or they just sat there doing nothing. That's the problem with player elimination. You better know what you're getting into ahead of time. Like you better have games that other people can go and do or something like that while you're doing it. Or if you enjoy that sort of thing, great. Just not us. We do not enjoy player elimination. So if that's your bag, great. Your bag? That, isn't that what the cool kids say? Anyway. No. That's it for Stuff We Like, Stuff We Hate this week. This it's is like if you're Auburn football. It's true. And you're losing really bad. You still get to play all four quarters, even if you're doing terribly. They let you finish the game because you want to. Which you're doing terribly because you're Auburn or LSU anyway. <laughs> No, seriously. Uh, it's very true, though. But she's right. You get to play the whole game, even if you're a horrible, horrible, horrible losing college football team. That's just how it works. You know? So that's it for Stuff We Like, Stuff We Hate today. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, at The Latest Retro, and we will see you next time. Hey, everybody. It's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flair. On 15 pieces of flair, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up your game room. One of the first few people to like my Facebook page, James Parsons, just won a giveaway. And one of his favorite games is Dead of Winter. And that happens to be one of my favorite games also. I like how the zombies in that game aren't all that big of a deal, but sometimes those crossroads cards really get the theme rolling in that game. But I thought it would be a great time to make some good zombie flair, so... Let's check it out. For this project, we're gonna need to keep calm and carry on tin sign, red and blue craft paint, a mixing tray, a large number 12 paintbrush, and some water. The first thing I did was squirt a generous amount of red paint into my mixer. Then I added a little bit of blue to a different spot. From there, I use the back of my paintbrush to mix a little bit of the blue into the red to give a nice blood color. Add more blue or red until you get it just right. Then get on a surface that you don't mind getting paint on it and grab your sign. Using your finger, write, run, zombies coming, onto the sign. When I wrote it out, I probably could have benefited from dabbing my finger off a little bit more to prevent overly gloppy areas. Then. Grab your water and pour it into a section of your mixer. Then add your blood color to it to thin it way out. You may need to add a little bit more blue to darken it up a little bit because the water seemed to lighten it up quite a bit. Then using the brush bristles, soak up as much of the watered down blood color as you can. Then fling a streak of paint onto the sign. Boom, there you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. Guys, this has been one of the easier pieces of flair I've made before. And I know that in my game group, people would make a comment about this sign probably every time they came over, especially when we play Dead of Winter. So give it a try. Hey, if you guys have any games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below or go to my Facebook page, Peak Your Interest. Hey, don't forget, especially you, Sam, because I know you don't have 15. 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Have fun, everybody. Hey, hey, welcome to Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is Will Learn As We Go, where normally I would be talking to you about a game and how I would teach that particular game. But this week, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm in my car and I just got off of work. I'm here in the parking lot because I'm about to drive down to Orlando to go to Dice Tower Con. Uh, and as I was packing and thinking about going to the convention, things like that, I had a few friends ask me questions that made me realize some people are kind of intimidated by the whole convention process. Because I've had questions like, how do you sit down with people that you don't even know and play a game with them? Do you play your own games? Do they bring games? Do you check out games? And so I thought I would take this time to do a video and take you through a typical time that I'd have at the convention center. Well, you're gonna see me walk into the convention center, go to the checkout center, check out a game, sit down with that game, and hopefully somebody will sit down and wanna play it with me. We'll see how it goes though. At the hotel, uh, I'm gonna see if I can go down to the convention center and play a game before lunch. So 
Let's course, go. if you don't want to check out a game, you could go see the exhibitors or go to the demo areas or go to the hot game zone. Um, so there's a lot of options here. So here's the game I checked out. I checked out Pyramid Arcade from Looney Labs because I heard that this is a bunch of mini games in a game. Whoa, look at these pyramids. All right, this, this is pretty cool. Ooh. So I got the game, I sat down, and I grabbed the Players Wanted sign because I need players to play this game with me. Um, there are also Teachers Wanted signs available, but yeah, I don't think I need that. I think I can figure this out. So I'm going to be reading the rule book while I wait for players to come and show up. I'm Kate, I'm playing Looney Ludos. Hi, I'm Heather, I'm playing Looney Ludo. Hi, I'm Genevieve, Jen for short. I'm also playing Looney Ludos. Hi, I'm Jamie, I'm playing Looney Ludo and Pyramid Arcade. Hey! Hi, I'm Tyler, I saw some lonely people here, so I sat down <laughs> and joined them with these weird pyramids. <laughs> so yep, all you have to do is put up a player's wanted sign, and the people will come. All right, I gotta play a game now. Bye, guys. So that's all I had to do. Just sit down with a game that I wanted to play at the convention center after I've checked it out, put up a few signs, and people come play the game with you. Also, you run into random things like this when you come to Dice Tower. Oh, I mean, if it's the same oh, price. That was nothing. <laughs> Two times six. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. All right, so it might have been hard to tell from the video, but I ran into Tom Vassal and participated in an impromptu tumble and dice tournament. I ended up winning a dice tower. So, as you can tell, conventions are really fun. Uh, next time I'll get around to talking about particular games and how I would teach those particular games. But until then, you've been watching We'll Learn As We Go on Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and I'll see you next time. Bye. I gotta go play some more games. Ahoy there, Throat Punchies! I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner, and I'm back again for three reasons where I do something vaguely related to the number three. A couple weeks ago, I talked about my Origins most anticipated games. Origins has come, Origins has gone. I shot over a hundred interviews at Origins. I saw a lot of games, but I took home a lot of games, and I'm going to be talking about my top three, and also, duh, 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 my bottom three games that I picked up at Origins 2017. Full disclaimer, some of these games are a little bit on the older side. I think I have a 2016 release in there, but still, it's new to me, so it might be new to you. So, first and foremost, my bottom three. Let's start at number three. We have Rick and Morty Anatomy Park, the game from Cryptozoic. So I just recently got to Rick and Morty. I was very excited when I did an interview for them with about this game. It sounded like it was going to be a hobby game, but it was going to have Rick and Morty just ooh, oozing theme, Rick and Morty. And the game does ooze Rick and Morty theme, which I like a lot. Unfortunately, the game is just way too light for my personal taste. I don't think it's a bad game. I just... It's not a game for me. I, I said this in my review, and I think this really states it best. This seems like a game that was designed for Rick and Morty fans who wanted to dabble in board games as opposed to board gamers who love Rick and Morty. So take that for what you will. For me personally, my number three disappointment. Moving on to my number three exciting game that I got. That is Game Election from Naturalist Games. This is a really cool concept for a game. This is a, a micro S game, so it's only going to take about five or ten minutes, and this is going to help you select the game that you are going to play next at game night. You put, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight games on the table, and then you're going to have a deck of cards that you're going to use to vote for the games that you want, the games that you don't want, and the games you just flat out veto. And it uses this really ingenious point system. It is a fantastic game. If you have analysis paralysis on your game night about which games to play, this is what you need to get. It is really, really cool. Highly recommend and game election from Naturalist Games. Moving on to my number two most... Oh, disappointment. Oh, yeah, we're on the disappointment side. Oh, wah. Well, this is actually from Naturalist Games as well, oddly enough, and that is Costume Party. So I was really intrigued by the idea of Costume Party. It, it goes up to eight players, which scratches a lot of my itches. It has a really cool theme. It had various different costumes that had cool special abilities and a theme that was interesting where you're trying to go to a costume party and not have on the same costume as someone else. However, after the first round, we were like, yeah, this is decent. And then the second round was the exact same. And the third round was the exact same. And the fourth round was the exact same. And we're just like, oh, God. And then the second game, it just the games just progressively got worse and worse as we got bored with the game. So unfortunately, my number two disappointment is Costume Party from Naturalist Games. Moving on to my number two most exciting thing that I got at Origins 2017, also one of my grail games, coincidentally enough, that is Tumble and Dice, the 2017 edition from Eagle Griffin Games. And I got to tell you, 
This thing got a Bowers Best Seal. I love this. I love this. I love this. It is light. It is simple. It is one of those games that whenever I have a family get together that I'm going to, I will always bring it. It's just component wise is what you're really wondering. And yes, it actually fits in this box. It comes unassembled. It doesn't feel cheap or chintzy and it fits in there really nicely. And oh, I can't say enough about it. If you've been thinking about getting Tumbling Dice, pull the trigger on this edition. Tumbling Dice 2017 edition from Neil Griffin Games. Highly recommend this one. Moving on to my number one disappointment of Origins 2017. It's actually a super old game, and it's actually my own ignorance and stupidity, and that is Dominion Intrigue. And you're like, Bauer, what are you talking about? Why is Dominion Intrigue on your bottom disappointment games of Origins 2017? That's because I am terrible, terrible, terrible at Board Game Geek math trades. I end up picking up three copies of this Dominion Intrigue. I only wanted one. I also ended up picking up a copy of the original Dominion somehow, which I already have a copy of, and I was also supposed to get a copy of Dominion Seaside, but somehow I forgot that the person was there to give me the copy of Dominion Seaside, so I left without picking up that copy, and then I just said, you could just have it. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. So really, it's not so much on Dominion, it's on the fact that I'm a moron when it comes to board game geek math trades. Let's move on to number one. So my number one most exciting game that I got at Origins 2017 with a bullet, and this is in early contention for one of my favorite games of the year, easily my favorite expansion of the year, that is Vegas Wits and Wagers. This is an expansion to Wits and Wagers Family Edition, I do believe it is, and it adds more gambling and it brings this game back to life for me. It's coming to Kickstarter actually in the next month, I think, and wow, if you like Wits and Wagers, if you've liked playing Wits and Wagers, if you have Wits and Wagers on your shelf and it just never gets played again, this will bring it back. This expansion comes with this giant play mat, it adds a seventh player, and it just adds more gambling options, is fantastic, wholeheartedly recommended. It wowed me, I love it, I never want to give it up. So those are my top three and bottom three Origins games that I got a chance to check out. What did I miss? Let me know in the comments below. What did you like best at Origins 2017 or disappointed you most at Origins 2017? And as always, back to more throw punchy goodness. <laughs>everybody welcome back to another accessorize segment of throat punch lunch i'm here at the arena as he calls it uh we're at rob's house and uh we just got done with dice tower kind so we're doing a segment together yeah because i just had nothing for kickstarter thrash up <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it so we're going to do this we're taking a look at some game topper tables that Kevin Burkhardsmeyer, better known as Berkey from the Berkey and Badger podcast, uh, he's also known as the Sheriff and the Viking King, uh, if you see him around some of these different conventions that are moving around, so he's got a lot of different personas. I forget Happy Mouth Spices. That's right, the Spice King. He is the uh, leader of Arrakis as well, so that's a in-depth Dune joke. You might not get it. I thought he was the Quizar Hatterack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. Let's check out his game topper tables. All right, so on this accessorize, we're going to be showing you um, the game topper tables, or game table toppers. I don't know, what is he calling them? He calls it game toppers. Yeah, game toppers. These are from uh, Kevin Burkhardt's Meyer. He is a, a ace of all trades, it seems like. Everything he touches just turns to gold. And these are some tables, uh, toppers, that you can put on a regular table. As you can see, this is just one of those plastic Costco tables that you can buy for, what, like 50, 60 bucks? I got it for 30 bucks. Oh, you got it for 30 bucks. There you go. Look at me. And uh, Berkey is, is, sell, is going to be selling these game topper tables that you can put on top of a regular table. So uh, this is Rob's copy. So go ahead, Rob. You can explain how everything goes. Well, when we had Berkey here the other day, he was explaining how everything is really off this aluminum base. Everything is solid wood, and they're really amazing because they really stabilize. Underneath everything is a, there's a rubber foam that, so it doesn't move, mm -hmm. okay? And when you put the other part on and solidify it, and I'm just making an adjustment here because I heard everything slide. It all comes together and really gives you a beautiful table without the expense of a geek chic, which doesn't exist anymore, type of uh, table. So we're going to show you how this all comes together. This is the uh, six foot version. Um, I think it's uh, four, and a half, four feet by six feet. 
So all I do is get my other half, which they're pretty light at 30 pounds, and they just come together. As you see, there's a notch here, right here, and then what we do, and Sam's gonna help here, and we just put that together. Whoops, just, just a little bit. But the real kicker is, is on your side, Sam, you can show everybody, there's a, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta loosen it, and two screws and two screws, and I do the same thing, and voila, you got a game table. As beautiful as you can imagine. And they have some nice foam inserts here that you can you can put in here, or, or everything, um, what do they call that stuff? The nice foam stuff. I don't know. Neither do I. Doesn't really matter. It just gives a different surface that is huh? a little bit neoprene. Oh, neoprene. neoprene. Boy, Thank we gotta get you. help from the outside. Thank you. But you put the nice neoprene on the inside, and you got yourself a professional game table. Felt. You could even Maybe it's you could even put felt in there too yeah. if you like and lay it in there. But the neoprene sticks right to it. Yeah. Everything slides nice and really gives you that finish. And the table is nice and it doesn't tip or anything like yeah. this. It, it stays on here sturdy. It doesn't come off. Mm -hmm. um, it is quite, it, it's amazing that you can have this and have yourself a good quality game table without the expense. That's correct. So as you can see, those are some pretty neat little things that you can accessorize. You can have yourself a nice game table without really having to spend a whole boatload of cash. Uh, and, and, and for we have that, where we have that, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Instead of playing on that, that plastic white table, mm -hmm. it, it makes it look like you have a million dollar table right there. <laughs> it really right. does, and it, and it changes the whole dynamic of everything. Now he's still researching all of the stuff he needs to, to come down to an exact price on how what he's gonna charge for each of these things. This is my, uh, where my part comes in. Okay, go ahead. Hey, it's gonna be on Kickstarter before the end of the year. There we got Kickstarter Thrash there Up. There you go. That's Kickstarter Thrash Up too. <laughs> Two in one. You got it all here. Well, but, but he's going to be doing that. He, he wants. To, he's a perfectionist when it comes to this, and he wants yeah. to make sure that it is dead on. And let me tell you something. What he has out there, it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is really cool. He he was able to take a few minutes and talk to me about a couple of things yesterday, and he's really working hard on getting shipping down to the bare minimum. He's getting down to the penny. Uh, yeah, I mean he's working really hard. So when that does actually go live, give him some love. Go take a look at it, and uh, we'll see how it goes after that. But that is this week's accessorize with Rob Horn. See you on the flip side. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Card Game Breakdown. Now even though this is the second episode of the Budget Card Game Breakdown, we're actually going to cover a game that's kind of like a CCG, but it actually uses poker chips. And that game is called Clout Fantasy. Came out in the early 2000s, I think 2007 around there. But basically what this game is, each player is going to have a deck of cards essentially, but it's called a stack of chips. And you're going to take turns throwing these at the board with dexterity. When they land, you actually apply different abilities that they have towards the opponent's, um, towards the opponent's chips and try to eliminate them. Once both players have thrown all their chips, whoever has the most clout points in play at that point is the winner. So let me show you the, the stack of chips here. This is the elf faction. This is the starter deck that it comes with. And you can see that you have different stats on the chip. These points in the middle, these little circles, are called clout points. You get 25 or less of those to spend on your deck. Sorry, your, your stack of chips. Your stack has to include 15 uh, chips from your faction, although you are allowed to choose neutral chips like these white ones here. You can have, I think, two of those in a, in a stack. And basically, there's also two bases that you have to include. Let me show you a different one from a different faction. These bases up here are marked like that. And the idea are, uh, the bases will go into play, you can play them whenever, because on your turn you're going to select one chip from your stack and throw it into play. The bases you want to keep into play because they give a bonus point to any of your chips within range. And so, like for instance, this is worth two, this is a base but it wouldn't count, but if it was a unit that was close to this and it was worth two, it would actually be worth three at the end of the game. And then whoever has the most points is the winner. So let me show you kind of what these chips are. This chip right here 
is your basic, uh, one of your basic units for the Elf Faction. You can see this number here in the oval, that's its range. Now the way range is measured is in centimeters, so if it's laying here, this is the ruler that the game came with, although I've kind of butchered it a little bit to be easier to grip, but you would measure like this, so in this case, this would be in, within range too. You do the black, black lines, the red lines are for handicapping if you want to do that. Anyway, on top of that, you have the shield value, which is its hit points. If it ever takes damage equal to or more than its shield, it's removed from play, easy enough. And then you have the special abilities. So like I said, you throw a chip in, let's say this is what we're attacking. Uh, it is all worth noting that not every chip can attack. They actually have to have the strike ability like this one. This is gonna strike at two range and deal one point of damage. So we can see this chip down here, even though it's my own faction, uh, it has one hit point that you can see over here on the shield. And so we're gonna have it right here and we're gonna try to kill it. Obviously I'm super close right now, but it's okay. So we can see that's in within range. I can, you know, measure all around it. I'm gonna apply it to this chip right here and remove it from play. Which you can see this chip does not have any clout points, so it won't really give me any bonuses, but this chip allows you to boost, so it's gonna boost all attack abilities for friendly chips by one within one range. So it's, it's worth getting rid of. There's a couple different factions. You've got like the undead faction. You have the, uh, which they like to do a lot of different things like raising and they're immune to counter strikes. They have a lot of cool uh, different abilities to them. The purple faction, which I think is the centaur faction, they can move their chips around when they land and then do their abilities. You've got the orange faction with the orcs. They got team abilities so they can team up and do a lot of bonus damage and such. And then you have the chase faction. This is the one thing I think the game was failed on when it was released originally. These are the dragons, and these dragons are really hard to come by even now. The thing is, when you bought this game, you would actually get a, a starter deck and if you wanted to buy a booster, you would get two chips, just two. And it could be any faction. They could be um, the dragon faction as well. They did come out with two expansions. Each one of those introduced a new faction. Now the thing is, it's just $3 for one pack was crazy. But now that you can find this game on eBay and things like that, you can get booster boxes pretty reasonably. Uh, so I, I highly recommend checking it out. I heard that this game was picked up by Crash of Games and uh, the license was, and maybe it was gonna come back out. They have, they have since closed their shop, so I don't know what's happening to it now, but uh, I'd really like to see this come back as a non-collectible format. I think that would work really well. But overall, just a really fun game, uh, especially if you take away the, the cost aspect of this whole thing. Uh, it's, really, it's really fun at that point, but I can see it would be frustrating back in the time when you're trying to collect for it. So if you have any other questions, feel free to email me at timjanet at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter and social media below. And uh, hope you enjoy Cloud if you check it out. If you do, comment below. Let me know if you play. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mark Windsor. And we're doing our designer spotlight. Now, today's designer, we've got a selection of his games here, is Stefan Feld. So, uh, for example, you may have heard of the Oracle of Delphi. Castles of Burgundy. And Bora Bora. Probably Castles of Burgundy is his most famous game. Um, but the reason we wanted to do this uh, spotlight is because when we first started playing games, I don't know about you guys, but I was certainly never aware of the name of the designer, particularly. We didn't really pay attention to the name on the box. Um, but we found it's a great way of discovering new games. It might be that you like one or two games by a particular designer, you don't realise they're the same designer, and then you discover other games by the same designer, and it's like, oh, I really like this one as well. You find particular designers often design the same kind of game, so if you like two or three Steffenfeld games, you're probably going to like a couple of the others as well, so yeah. look out for things you might be interested in here. So what do we think of Steffenfeld overall as a designer? What kind of designer is he? Uh, he's known for his lack of theme. He generally <laughs> kind of adds the theme on later. And uh, the bit I like about Steffenfeld is that mechanically his games are very, very sound. Yeah. There are yeah. so many interconnecting bits. Some games it feels like it's just six mechanics stuck together. But some games they think it's just so smooth and the fact that you can use those mechanics. Generally you're really struggling with things to do in your turn, but you can use yeah. rules and bits in the game to get extra goes or to get extra bits. With that kind of they're always very game. tight, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I like point style style games because I think it gives you lots of options. You don't, and it means that you get to look at what everybody else is doing and try to do something different. You're not all fighting on the same path. I just like the way all the systems often intricately interwoven together, and often the, the actual scoring can be quite difficult to work out initially. You have mm. to kind of think, yeah. "Am I going to get and succeed in my plan?" Mm. 
the point salad is very much yeah. a, a method that he likes to use in his games. And it's certainly effective in that it gives you lots to think about. I've got to get a bit of this and a bit of that. Mm. It can, I think that's one of the things that help means that it's not always very thematic though, because mm. it is just lots of bits. He's, he's also known for his dice, use of dice, mm. and his oh, use yeah. of dice where rolling high isn't necessarily good. I think all that's three, three. <laughs> in all three games you'll find, oh, yeah, that's what we're talk about. I never thought all three about games are, are dice games where actually it's not who rolls the highest, where in some games it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. So talk us about Oracle Delphi, Jonathan. All right, so uh, this is actually my favorite of all the Steffenfeld games. And unlike most of his games, this is not a point salad. It's like a racing game. Not that you're racing around a track or anything, but you have a number of objectives to complete. In this case, case it's the 12 tasks of use, is yeah, it? Yeah, I believe so. And you're kind of sailing your ship around various islands, trying to deliver some things and uh, fight some monsters. And you've got a number of tasks you have to accomplish. And it's the done by rolling dice, essentially, but whoever accomplishes the tasks first is the winner. And I really like that kind of race aspect of the game. Uh, Castles of Burgundy is a tile lane game. You've got a kingdom, very, very, the theme is very, very light here. You've got a kingdom and you're basically on your turn, you roll two dice. And you can do, you can use those dice to acquire tiles, or use those dice to place tiles, or use those dice to activate abilities, or use those dice to get workers. But it's all to do with the two dice you roll on your turn. And over five turns, a year's ended, and then the board refreshes. And you're trying to kind of fill out your kingdom to the best you can, using various um, point scoring rules. It's probably its highest rated game, I think something like 15 yeah. on yeah. Board Game Geek. It, it's a, one of his older games, but a lot of people I think will consider it his best game. Uh, and this one, Bora Bora, you're essentially a, I guess, a, a tribe on a tropical set of islands. Uh, I love the fact that you give essentially give six options with the dice, but the higher dice roll to give you more options, then but they also block people taking that action. So yeah, it nice. it's because, I mean, there's also a lot of ways with also to adjust your dice in this game, so you don't get trapped into a corner as much as you think you're going to. You're going to think that the way that works would block you off, but you just got to make sure you've always got an out, a way to get around it, and it's really important. He's very good at all his games mitigating yeah. the dice rolls. If you if you got workers or gods or favour tokens, you can mitigate your bad rolls. Mm. Yep. All right, great. Well, thanks for watching. That was Stefan Feld, our designer spotlight. We've been Board Game Opinions. Bye. See ya. Miniatures Games has a special place in my heart, because when I was growing up, I watched my dad paint thousands of them. He was a huge war gamer, Warhammer, Civil War, any kind of historical war gaming, my dad was into it. My brother and I have both become avid miniatures painters because of this influence. Check out the Golden Turtleback Monthly Painting Contest on BGG to check out some of my brother's work. A nice miniatures games can make me feel more like I'm in a video game than watching a movie or playing a video game. One particular type of miniatures games I enjoy is the one versus many. One guy controls the bad guys, the demons, the monsters, or Dracula, and the other players control the heroes. The mechanics of how the two sides functions is always different. Last year alone there was a bunch of these games released. The Others, Doom, Conan, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, not to mention the prominent ones like Imperial Assault or Descent 2nd Edition, Specter Ops, Dracula, Not Alone. Now these games can be quite expensive, so I want to take a look at all these games and give you my thoughts on them. Maybe help you decide which one is right for you, and at the very least start a discussion. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses, whether it requires a long campaign or a one-off adventure. Do you go hard as the one, or are you acting like a dungeon master, helping the other players have a good time? Each episode, I'm going to focus on one of these games. The first game I'll be highlighting is the one I've played the most, and one of my top favorite games of all time. Conan. I'm Jason Peacock, thanks for watching, and I will catch you on the next Throat Punch Lunch. Hey everyone, 
thanks for tuning in to another Fruit Punch Lunch and to my segment, The Starting Tile. This is the show where I look at gateway games, both old and new, both ones that you've missed under the radar, both ones that you've actually just already had in your hand and you just haven't gotten to the table yet. I will check out pretty much any game that classes itself to be a gateway game because I find myself teaching new gamers all the time. And this one holds a bit of a dear spot in my heart from a while back. I had an ex-girlfriend who was somebody who wasn't that into games, but trying to get her to play a few gateway games was a bit of a challenge because, you know, she had that, you could only teach her games by doing it. You could not teach her rules, you could not get her to read a rule book, you had to literally play the game without saying a word and just let her get into it. So you would probably have one or two learning games, but at least once that is done, she would be perfect. You know, it'd be like, right, we can play this game. So I needed a gateway game that was simple and easy to just literally play straight out of the box with little to no explanation. On top of that, we also liked going camping together, so we needed something very portable. And this one just fit the bill completely. Hanabi. Now some of you might not have seen this, some of you have probably already heard of it and just flown on straight by, but this one is a fantastic little portable card game from Antoine Balzer. And if anybody knows that name, they know that Antoine Balzer is linked to a ton of great little games. Be it card games, be it board games, he is just on fire when it comes to making quality games. And Hanabi is no exception. Hanabi is dirt portable. As you can see, incredibly small. And it's a light card game where you are basically building firework displays. And, well, the theme could literally be non-existent. It really doesn't matter. The idea of this, though, is that you have to essentially put out five different color piles in order from one to five. Okay, that doesn't sound great by itself. I get that. But here's a twist. You have a hand of cards and you face them away from you without looking at them. So you don't know what your hand is holding. You only know what your teammates are having because this is a full-fledged co-op and you can play this with up to five players but I had probably the most fun playing this as a two-player just with the ex-girlfriend. So the turn order is dirt simple. You either play a card in the middle, hope it fits, or you discard a card, hope it's not the one you really needed and get a clue token back or you spend one of these clue tokens in order to give the clue about the other person's hand. You have to state whether certain cards link have a matching number or a matching color and you can't separate them, you have to go for them all. And that's it, there's no other form of communication in this game. If you try to do it where you're whole sort of going, you know, like, you know, really dodgy winking or really creepy expressions, certainly with me it would be, and it really, you can't do that. This is just pure, straight up, here's the clue, that's it. But Hanabi is one of those little underrated gems that you really should give another look. It's, it's great. It works for you and your non-gamer spouse. It works for you and your gamer spouse. It works for you and your group of friends that you're literally just explaining the gaming hobby to them in general. It fits all those bills. Okay, the theme is non-existent, but it's a quick little filler co-op game. So whatever teaching style you have and whatever learning style they have, Hanabi is a great little gateway game to pick up and show to them. So that's it for me for another episode of The Starting Tile. I hope you enjoy the rest of the Fruit Punch Lunch. And remember, even if your fireworks go off a little bit early, at the end of the day, it's only a game, so just play again. See you soon. So that's that for another Throat Punch Lunch down the tubes, so to speak. I don't know if I like that reference. But anyway, I think you get the idea. We're over and done with this one. Don't forget the contest for Zombicide Black Plague. This little guy right here, do some workout with it. Uh, when you get home, send me an email to DiceTowerSam at gmail.com telling me how you got into the hobby. And then from those emails, we will generate one random winner, and you'll receive this copy of Zombicide Black Plague. So... Uh, thank you again to all of my contributors. You guys are doing such a terrific job with uh, getting your segments in on time and all that good stuff and uh, just making great content for our viewers. Thank you, viewers, for giving us a watch, and I hope you liked it as much as we do putting it together. So without further ado, I'm going to let you guys go. We'll see you in a couple weeks for the next episode on the flip side.
Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.